Jason Soli, Rose, and um, Soli has passed on, but she was ill, and before she passed, she donated this tree to me. So uh, both her and Chase are, are, dear, are dear friends and uh, were a big part of uh, my career in the early parts of supporting me through the National Collection. And so this tree, of course, is super unique, right? The trunk is really zigzag. All of the white stuff is dead. This would be considered a live vein, so it's only this one. Hello. So, um, so we this is a so we chose a round container for this. Okay, the trunk has so much movement and it extends out. Having a round container takes it out of the equation. If it was a rectangular tank, a tank. If it was a rectangular pot, I have fish tanks on my brain all the time. If it was a rectangular pot. The pot would then cover more of the span of this movement. And by having the pot be shorter, it could be even be a little smaller, but the roots are really big. So even if it was here, the more it would be like this, the more of this you see. And the more height that you get off of the bench to the branch, the more dramatic it is. That's why we put our cascades and our semi-cascades up on pedestals. It's that height and that drama that makes it seem like that's coming over. So this tree maybe was growing out of a crevice somewhere, and then this died, right? And this jetted off, and then this broke, and then it started growing this way. And um, so it's really cool. Shimpaku junipers have a really nice small foliage, which is why they're sought after. And um, and so, and this is a Japanese container. Uh, this is a, although cheap, a Japanese kind of container. And uh, it has just a little wild strawberry in there, which of course makes nice little flowers and fruit and it's pretty contrasting so we have not only a color but a glaze in our accent plant and here of course this is unglazed and it actually is reminiscent junipers have more of a reddish part so this is more of a brown but very earth tone right just matches the soil the idea for this one is that i just want the pot to not be there i just want you to see this trunk see how amazing the movement and the and the uh and all of the deadwood and all of that. That's where the interest in this. And all of that probably was done by the artist, right? So this is one that probably, although this potentially could have been collected, um, this, you know, this deadwood, much of this deadwood, you can tell was done by some, by the artist. And so we really just want to highlight that, highlight the trunk movement. And then the foliage is used oftentimes to frame things in. So we're, we're using foliage to frame in different things and frame in different pieces of dead wood. And I'll show you some other examples of that too. So really nice tree, great story, dear friends. And uh, it's, a, it's an honor to have this tree as well. That blooms and um, there's one, there's like two little flowers here that are starting. And so it's coming along. Um, this is right about the time. This is right about the time of year. So I always hope for it to be done by this weekend every year, but it's always like a the next week. So when these start to simmer down, then this will take off. And uh, this container is by Eli Akins, who is a potter. Um, it's a Waldo Street Pottery out of Atlanta. And so you can see this container is very complimentary. When it gets its fall color, um, it's just it's really it's just really nice. I like the richness of it. I like the fade of it, and the and the fall color on this is just it's just it just. It looks like a pumpkin spice latte. It's just like this perfect fall thing. And so not wanting to contrast this, wanting to keep this very complimentary. Um, this was very flat. And a couple of years ago, I actually moved these little trees to the front. So as we talked about a little bit inside for those that were in there, when we're creating interesting forests, there's a few factors that come into play. Of course, with any tree, you know, foliage size and, and tree size and creating scale and proportion is important. Um, but we want to create this, you know, the, the view, the look of a, a natural forest. So you often have a primary tree, right? That would be the, the, the parent tree that grows to maturity and starts to set, starts to reproduce and set seed. And then you start having other trees that are kind of popping up. So typically you'll have, you know, your smaller trees either towards the front or the back. Having small trees in the back gives you that illusion that they're far away and they look small. Having trees, small trees on the periphery also, when you're just even driving down the highway and you see a forested area, that the periphery in the front is where you see the seedlings and the saplings because they find light. They find a place to come out. Not many seedlings are going to make it if they start in the center of the mix. So they're not going to get enough resources. So, Or they're going to have like one long crazy branch that goes to a, a, an opening. 
So by moving these up in the front, it created more depth and broke this flat front that it had, which really bothered me. Trunk, di trunk differentiation in size is, is obviously important as well. So we number them typically. So you have your one tree, here's your two tree, and then you know your, your third tree might be here, and four. And so your, you, you want to have your thickest tree, of course, be your tallest. If this high tree was a really thick trunk, of course, it would break that illusion that it was a real forest. And so having differentiation in size, having depth, and having peripheral growth is, is what makes it an interesting forest. And so you don't always, you know, they can be mixed up, they can be split apart. There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, we don't like to have straight lines. You know, you, you think of row trees, you're thinking of trees that are being cultivated and grown. So we like to mix things up using triangular uh, kind of groupings and, and ideally not drawing a straight line uh, for any length with, with uh, the different tree species. So randomness is key. So we go through a lot of, we go through like painstaking efforts in bonsai to manipulate and create things, but also make it look like we weren't there, right? So you don't, the greatest, you know, compliment is that it doesn't look like anyone's ever worked on. And right, so that's the, the I like to, that's for me, that's what I'm shooting for. To totally remove myself from it and make it just seem like that's the way it's supposed to be. And that's how it would grow. So you don't want to see that manipulation. But so we go through, we do all these things to make things look natural, but it's all a very like a process thing. So like I said, much of this was created before me. I've altered it slightly, I think, to kind of improve that depth of field. And then, um, and then you know, having a great species, hornbeam is an, a great bonsai species. It has a nice leaf that can be reduced. Um, there's American hornbeam. These are Korean hornbeam, if I'm correct. Yes. And so, um, so we're using more American hornbeams here as well. Great species, ironwood. They're sometimes referred to, and they're super hardy, super tough. They get great bark, uh, great color, and then great little fenestrations and, and different colors and stuff. So. They make uh, they make really nice full time material, but nice container and um, and, a, and a nice form. Uh, great lady, and she donated it. Not exactly, not exactly my favorite. It's very shiny. It looks very new, right? And it's an old tree. You can see that by the bark exfoliating. You know, it's got these roots coming down. This has obviously been trained over this rock, and so it's an old looking tree. And when you have a shiny kind of new. Container, I don't feel like that conveys that aging character. So this is one that's on the list for uh, a new old container. Um, and uh, so I think that will pair well. However, the blue with the contrast of the fall color is really nice. And so uh, this is the pot of came in, and, but uh, at some point this will get switched out as well. So these guys are out again early in the year. They'll start to come off. The ginkgo will also come off here very shortly. Um, as soon as it warms up a little more, it was actually even looking a little stressed last week, but these cool days, it greened right up. And um, we've been feeding heavy out here too. And, uh, but with the sun, the deciduous trees will start coming off probably in about two weeks or so. Ginkgos will be first. Uh, the larch, we throw the larch off early too. Uh, this year, a couple of the larch got repotted, so they're not out in the spring, but they'll be out in the fall for the fall color. Okay. So this is a rap, this is called a rap style. So this is really kind of a cool style. What this would represent would be a tree growing up, of course, and then it would have fallen down. A lot of times you'll see that, and you'll see the backside root mass, where half of that root mass is sticking up, the trunk is laying on the ground, but the roots that are growing there are still supporting the tree enough that the branches that are facing up, or the branches basically that are not facing down, will start to grow. And over time, they'll take on the form of a tree instead of a branch. And so this is a, this is something that you will see in nature. I don't you don't see it a ton, or certainly see it. I think as nicely done as this was done uh, by a man named Fred Hollowell many many years ago. And it was very much that it was an upright juniper that didn't have a lot of branches on one side. And so he laid it down. You can score the bottom and put rooting hormone on, and you can start to encourage roots to grow. As you can see, this actually has great root growth off of the primary trunk, and that's a great indication of how old the tree is. So it was put together a long time ago. Again, the main root would have been over here. It would have been laid down. Keep this root intact. You can keep the whole thing intact and have it covered. And then over time, 
you start to kind of remove the soil from the top end of the root mass. And then as it starts to produce roots along the trunk line, those roots are now supporting those once branches. And, um, and then you don't need this backside as much. And then it gets taken away. So um, I've seen more people doing wrap styles and I've seen like bonsai videos and uh, Ryan Neal did a really cool beach one and um, we're just seeing more more of it being done and being done better. So this one's pretty classic, laid down, pretty straight trunk, all of the new stuff is coming off and uh, it's in a really cool long container. I had put this on a slab at some point um, and it, it definitely gave it a more natural look to it. Uh, but the moss wasn't doing well out here. So we've got a tree that will tolerate the heat and the sun of the summer, but then the moss always looked bad because it was brown. And so and then I was not putting it out. And uh, anyway, so we switched it back to the container. It's actually a challenging pot to water in because it's so shallow. So part of our uh, creating bonsai is the soil. And so again, we use uh, a product called Akadama here, which is a mine clay-like material we use pumice and lava rock. So it's very well draining. The Akadama will slowly break down over time, but in the initial parts of watering and with deeper containers, you get percolation. So the water is being watered, the trees being watered through, the water is drawing through and it's pulling oxygen in behind it. So you have this great oxygen water exchange. It's very healthy for the roots and it gets great root growth. As the soil breaks down, that percolation slows down and pots do not draw as much oxygen in. And that's where you start to, when you're losing drainage, that's when we start thinking about repotting our plants. And so with this container, even when the soil is loose, it's so shallow that you don't really get a ton of percolation. And it stays wet for a really long time, despite being really shallow versus some of the other plants that are in deeper pots. So it's actually a little bit challenging because it is a juniper and it doesn't want to have wet feet all the time. It can sometimes be a little bit challenging to grow. Um, if it was a little deeper, we'd have better percolation of water and it would draw more oxygen through. So we're mindful of how it gets watered. And uh, actually in the in when it really kicks in, it's starting to push its new growth and you can see some areas, it gets a really blue, has a really nice blue color to the foliage. So we're still seeing some of the winter color. Um, juniper, some junipers will turn um, even significantly uh, bronzy or brownish colors in the, in the winter time and then they'll green up. So this one is still coming around, but we're getting nice new growth and it looks nice and blue. And uh, it's a really unique, it's a really unique tree. <laughs> and it was collected by uh, a man named Gary Marshall, and I believe Vaughn Banting collected this with him as well. Two very prominent uh, bonsai professionals, but also working with cypress trees. So they would collect them, they'd go in and collect them and um, again, we talked about this one a little bit here inside, and we were talking about how you, you know, the, the thickness of the trunk and the bases. And so the, the, the width of the base is a product of the height of the tree. So as the tree is growing in these swampy areas, right, maybe the ground is not very firm, right? It's kind of mushy and wet. So the trees start to send out these buttresses or these flares, and those flares are for stability. So the tree's growing tall, it's 15 or 20 feet tall, it's blowing in the breeze, so it needs to be wide in order so it doesn't fall down. So this root base, and it probably was covered by water at some point during the year, right? It might be in a flood basin, maybe the water level is up, so these buttresses flare out. Up here you can see where this cut point was. It's an old wound and it's healing up. But when this tree was collected, I imagine there were no branches on the lower part. It just would have been a stump, maybe a little bit here and there. But there wouldn't have been developed branches. So it would have been stumped, dug up, and brought, you know, and then they would let it grow and flush out, and then start picking and choosing and developing branches over time. And so this is more representative of a flat top style of cypress tree. So there's kind of two camps with the small cypress trees where People will do them in a more of a flat top style, or some people will do them more kind of like in a conical style, um, like you would see some other trees done. This kind of came as this flat top, and I and I do prefer that style, so we have worked to embellish that and, and, and continue that. This this branch was removed a few years ago um, because it was a little bit low, and I was trying to the the tree feels a little truncated to me. The pot is massive. 
This is another tree that this is like first on the list for a new container. I just haven't been able to find one. It needs a container that's a little big, but this is way too big. It shrinks the tree, in my opinion. It makes it short. So if the container was smaller, it would have less impact and the tree would seem taller. So this was removed as also part of that because this branch kind of came out here. And what it did was it stopped your eye and then your eye was going up. So by stopping your eye here, it made it seem even shorter. So that was removed, was made a gin. I probably embellished it a little more. Um, and so now it slow, maybe slows your eye down, but then it starts to come this way and it, and it kind of continues to lead you up. Because we want it to seem like a big tall tree, right? I don't want it to seem like a short tree in a big oversized container. So in order to combat the size of the container, um, we put, I put in these horsetail rush, this dwarf horsetail rush, and there's also some irises in there. And so um, I feel like that was something I could do to make it seem like it so much the vastness of the soil. So, um, and then this one has this little, uh, the water is evaporating now, but this has this little area here where these irises are also growing. Uh, in the summertime, it gets covered in duckweed, and I actually have a little uh, fake alligator that I put in there. You can only see the top of his back. And so, it might be a little kitschy, but it's like we're telling the story, right? We're having some fun. I literally had someone ask me if it was a real alligator once. And, um, and so, I can only say that I wish it was. Um, and, and so this is where we're just trying to tell a little bit of the story of where this would come, right? These plants would grow kind of on the shorelines, uh, in wet, boggy kind of areas, the irises, uh, they make a nice yellow flower. And so it helps tell the story, but again, we're mostly just kind of trying to cover up for the fact that in this case, it doesn't have the perfect pot. And, um, and sometimes we just have to live with that. These guys have a great bark, so I do brush the bark on these to get that reddish color. Um, some people leave it where it gets thicker and exfoliates off and stuff, but I, I kind of like the look of that. And with cypress trees, they grow really fast, and so their branches thicken up. So much of the work that's been done at this tree at the top, because Gary had passed for several years, and and um, you know, and, and so the tree had grown out, and so what we've been trying to do is regain the taper. And so when I say taper, we're going from thick to thin. Okay, and that's the way natural trees grow. You don't see big, thick, honking branches at the tops of trees because trees grow from their terminal points. So they grow from the tips here and they grow from the top. And so the terminal points are the thinnest because they're the newest. That's why the first branch, in, in, typically in trees, is always the thickest because it's the oldest branch, right? The trunk is the oldest part, so it's thick. And then your first branch is the thickest, your second branch, and so forth. And when you get to the top, you want to have nice thin branches. So when this tree first came, it had a lot more heavy branches at the top. And you can see that there is still some, there's uh, some scarring and stuff. And so there was, you know, big branches here, big branches. And so we've been, you know, so some of them were made into gins. And you can see we're starting to get a better taper. So we're going thick and then we are getting thin out here. And we're getting thin out here. So. Um, getting that taper removed, we just removed this big branch and this will be developed. So what we do is we let these little buds grow in places where we know that we need to cut it back or we need to get some more taper. So then, you know, some of them will get picked and plucked and some of them will go. So when this tree would have been cut, it would have been cut right here, stumped off, and it would have done these little buds that you're seeing back budding, like the whole trunk would have just been washed with those. And then, Gary would have picked, picked and chosen the ones he wanted and started to develop them. So the big thing with these, and there's another Von Banting uh, flat top cypress at the National Collection, and um, which is just an absolutely amazing tree, and the taper on that tree is so good, and it's a much more slender trunk tree, but even my time volunteering there and an intern there, it, I marveled at that tree because I certainly now know and I thought at the time I knew, but now I truly know how hard it is to keep that refinement and to keep those thin branches at the top because they send a ton of energy here. That's the whole premise of the flat top, right? It goes up to the sun and it flattens out and it makes it, and it just says, hey, I'm just taking all that sun in there. And then over time, the lower branches get weaker and weaker and they start to drop them. And then everything else starts churning up. And so that's really, I like, I really like this tree. Um, it has been such a joy to develop it. The gentleman who facilitated acquiring this tree, Rodney Clemens, um, 
I, he's the guy that I often still send pictures to all the time, and, and I'm always working through because he's uh, Rodney lives in Atlanta, but he works with a lot of cypress and southern species, and and um, he has been a great guide in this tree, and so. Um, it's really, it's a special tree from its provenance and its history to who helped me get the tree to, you know, everything. So it's really, um, as a bonsai professional, that's one of the cool things is being a part of that lineage, being a part of this tree's history. Now I am part of that chain. And um, with this tree and with many of the trees, it's, it's really special to be a part of working even after the people who have uh, done all of the really hard work in the beginning, like digging it out of the swamps and finding off alligators. And... This is Olive. Um, the original creator and donor is a woman named Melba Tucker. She's a very prominent uh, bonsai practitioner. And we have several trees from Melba, and I'll show you a couple of others. But this one was acquired by, uh, this is another permanent loan from the National Collection. And uh, this tree was also there when I was there. And it's a really special tree. I think olives are great trees. Um, they have really amazing bark. And this is another one of those trees that the backside is all deadened. So this would have been collected, uh, I believe in California. And this whole backside is like canoed out. And this used to be the front. Before the tree got donated here, they had actually changed the front of the tree at the National Collection, Jack did, and they started to change the style. And um, and so here you can see that, although the deadwood is not the bright white like you'll see in junipers, because we put a little bit of ink in there to gray it, excuse me, you can see these rolled areas. And these rolled areas are the live vein. And you can see that this this rolled vein, is this live vein here is coming up and attaching to that branch. This one in the back has one as well. This rolled, this rolled nature comes up. And then this one here, you can see this is all dead. And this is the live part that comes down. So as the tree is dying off, you know, those those raised areas, are they're still growing. They're still getting thicker, just like they would if the trunk was complete with live tissue. So that live tissue continues to expand. It continues to increase the vascular system in order to accommodate the branch. And so it's laying down wood as it's doing that, and it's getting thicker. So when you see a tree that has a live vein, you the, the, the deeper the roll is, the older that that live vein is. When you see them and they're pretty flat, then you can tell that it's been done recently. So this is, a, you know, this comes with age and with time. So this is an old tree. Uh, like I said, it was collected, but it's mostly all dead. Like if we remove, and this stuff here, this is all deadwood too. All of this. So the deadwood is... You know, still a big part of the structure of the tree, keeping it from just crumbling. And so at some point, you know, we keep treating the deadwood and slowing down the process of decay. Um, but, you know, over time, at some point, hopefully not for a long time, hopefully not till after I retire, uh, that deadwood may, you know, continue to, it will certainly continue to deteriorate. But it doesn't make olives, at least uh, it has not here, and uh, but it has a great leaf. Really tolerant of the conditions up here, has a nice, you know, these Mediterranean plants are tolerant of dry, hot conditions, and the leaves get like this little haze on them, which protects them from some of the sun, and they're very thick and kind of leathery. So, um, really interesting tree. Very, uh, and then, so this is the other Ron Lane container that was the limber pine, so Ron had made two for us. Um, this too was, it, uh, 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 I'll let you know another unfortunate story. This came in a container from the National Collection, which this is not. And during the moving of the tree, uh, one of the feet of it caught an edge on one of the carts and actually fractured. So we had to replace it. And I'm not sold that a round container is the best container for this tree. I do think it would be best uh, back in a rectangle. So this is yet another one that's on the list for new pots. Um, so some days I like it, other days I don't, um, but it's, it's, I think the best pot that we have to, to show the tree in the best way that we can right now. So, but another Ron Lang container, Ron made great containers. On Mr. Nakamura's beat, um, and you can see the base on this thing, it's super old, the bark is a beautiful color, probably, you know, 100 plus years old, I would assume, and, um, it's just a really wild tree. It has a ton of cut marks and they all need to be embellished. We've started doing that more um, where we're starting to actually work these 
instead of trying to hide cut marks or wait for them to heal over, which takes a long time, actually embellishing them, making them old, making them uh, making them into features, which is what would happen with a natural tree. This would rot back and die, and then it would create. So this year, this one will get more work like that. This won't be out very long as the conditions change anyway, and then we'll start to look. But this has a great old base. I don't know the history of this aside from it came from Mr. Nakamura, so it may have been grown in the ground, and that may be part of kind of the development of this base. Um, but either way, it has a really cool gnarly base. Again, the the white the white bark on the Japanese beach is just absolutely gorgeous. And uh, and and once we actually start to develop a few things uh, that right now I would consider to be uh, you know an eyesore or something, I think that the tree is really going to be a lot better moving forward so and the container you know a big oval it is a big solid tree this could easily be in a rectangle um the glaze you know it has it has more of a yellowy kind of fall color so it's it's a lighter blue which is okay um so i feel like this container is better than some of the others so although i feel like this could be improved um i feel like it's a better one and again we have an unglazed um accent plant it's a bigger accent plant but it really kind of balances out the the mass of the tree three donated straight there's a couple here that go a little bit straight they drop back um but the primary tree is right in the front and then the smaller trees are all pushing towards the back right and you can see the angle so when you're looking at stuff at a distance of course it gets smaller it gets further away as, as it gets further away. So you have this downward movement back here. You have the really small trees in the back. And it's almost se separated into a couple of groups. And here, of course, there's a couple of small ones too. The bark is absolutely amazing on all of these things. And these would have all been individual trees, of course. They would have been all, you know, most forests would have been individual trees that either would have been put together, um, you know, and then developed, or sometimes they'll be developed individually and then could be put together at some point. So I don't know how she would have done this, um, but they would have all been individual. When it comes out of the pot now, it's just one mat of, car, of, of, of roots. So it's just like a doormat basically. And then we will, you know, we'll prune, prune it, prune underneath. These guys are vigorous root growers. They grow lots of foliage, really small, nice leaves, which again, lends itself um, to the size of the tree and gives that scale and proportion that makes it seem like a tree in the distance versus um, a small tree sitting on a pot and a bench. So um, recently we I added a little, normally this has a ton of moss on it too. And because it got repotted this year, the moss came off. So we'll, we'll reapply moss to it. Um, we, I started adding a couple of stones and like a little path and stuff just to get a feel for that. There was uh, the potential of actually somewhat separating this and creating. Melvin made a lot of like rock plantings and group plantings, and there's one at the Pacific Bonsai Museum uh, that's also has you know that that is a group planting or forest planting that has these different rocks and stuff in it. So um, I was considering where these could be di three different clumps, basically where this would be one, this would be one, and this would be one and we could change the levels a little bit and break it up. So putting these rocks in this year and doing a little bit like that was a way for me to kind of uh, do it and get a sense of whether that was something I wanted to do um, and also look for a container that facilitate that because it would need to be a little bigger, potentially a little deeper to allow for having that, that change of, of uh, grade there. So, um, but it's a really beautiful planting and um, I'm not, my goal is never just to change things for changing sake. We can change things to improve it or help tell the story better for what we're doing here. Um, and knowing that Melba um, made a lot of plantings like that, um, those are all things I take into consideration when, when making changes on trees, certainly from prominent people or people who have been very influential in my life. Um, you know, you know, changing those things is not something I take lightly. And um, so that's why I'll take a year to settle in. We'll get moss in here, we'll add a few more rocks, and we can almost change the, the level by not even doing that, just by adding different features. And so, uh, but a really cool tree, great differentiation in size, great depth to it. And this is one example where this tree is really in the front. For the hornbeam, that tree's pushed back and there's smaller trees in the front. So a lot of that's just a taste. 
you know, here my goal is to show people as many different types and styles and kinds of bonsai being a public collection. So we're trying to do things that are more traditional. We're trying to do things that are more this American natural kind of uh, style that is developing using American potters and supporting American bonsai community using native species. And then, you know, we've created some things that are more like Penjing. We have a water land with a Korean horn being that is really kind of uh, the essence of what a Penjing would be. I would not call it a true Penjing because merely taking a tree and putting it on a slab doesn't make it a Penjing. And by, by no means have a full understanding of Penjing, but I really enjoy it. And I think it's worthy of, of, of showing it and then um, hopefully being able to bring some someone in to help me with developing my skills doing that form of this art form that we call bonsai, right? It's this, this art where we're taking these trees and manipulating them and using our horticultural knowledge to create something in somewhat of a miniature form that looks like something else to a degree, right? It's all somewhat abstract in its own way. And so, um, so that's really what we're trying to do. And so for me, again, as a public collection, it, I'm just trying to create things that um, speak to me, first off, and then also, you know, um, hopefully speak to you guys. So. Oval would be okay. I think a rectangle was better. Very strong, very, very thick at the base. Um, the glaze is uh, a nice color for the fall color. It's got a nice crackle finish to it. And you can see there's some differences in the glaze and everything. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good pot. It does have a little chip on the back. Um, excuse me. But this was the other tree I was talking about inside that would have undoubtedly been grown in the ground. So here you can see is this big scar. And that would have been where this tree would have been growing up from. And it would have been topped right here. And all of this would have been grown. These branches may probably have, would have been there during that development. And, you know, with this base and everything like that again. And that little twist in that movement would have happened when it was very young, when it was very thin. You put that twist of movement in, throw it in the ground, and in five to 10 years, you can go from something like, like that to that. And again, they have much more access to resources and they're growing and you're allowing them to grow tall. So by allowing them to grow tall, they have to grow wide in order to support the height. And then you cut them down and now it looks like a big massive tree that's, you know, less than 30 inches tall. So these leaves are still coming out. We did have crazy spring where we had 80 degree days and then we had 31 degree days and so some of the growth was slightly altered in some of the trees and so it's coming out a little slower and uh, I'm sure it will come out fine because it pretty much happens just about every year here um, but these guys are still kind of pushing out so they're a little bit clumped up now they'll open up and uh, and then um, it will look a little more full but here's another case where a tree was grown, you know, with the purposes of bonsai, right? This wasn't a tree that was grown and then someone just like dug it and decided like, I imagine that this was, was grown for the purposes of bonsai and all of that was very calculated. But this is a massive scar and it's all but healed up, right? If I didn't point it out, you might not have even noticed it. It's already flaking around here. So that gives you the indication of the age and how long ago that scar happened. So it would have been decades since that cut and the tree would have healed over. Now maples grow really quickly. And, and, um, but, uh, but yeah, this one is, uh, it's an interesting trick. So.